All right, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Looks like we have a few folks here. Um, let's wait a few, a minute or so to see if any other folks want to join in. All right, I see we have Alex on board. Um, so the main topic for tonight is star masking and Alex is going to introduce us to some of the nuances uh, that he's uncovered as he journeys through Pix Insight. So uh, if you're ready, uh, Alex, why don't you go ahead and grab the screen. Okay, I am and let's see what we can do here. Okay, you should be seeing the title pages. Anyone see that? Yep, looks good. Okay. Good. Okay, so what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about making star masks in Pix Insight. Um, star masks are very functional, but in fact, it's not very easy to do them. The technology for making star masks at least the kind I'm going to talk about is not very advanced apparently. Uh, if I have time at the end and can remember, I'll talk about an alternative way of making masks, which uses um, star catalogs. But for now, most of us make masks and picks insight using the picks insight tool that's available. Let's see again. Uh, so first of all, what is a star mask? And what we look at here is the picture on the left is the, it's the flame nebula, though I always forget the names. Uh, as it appears in one of my processed images, and on the right is the same image covered in a mask, which is tinted green so that we can see where it's covering it and where it isn't. So. We use the star mask to either reveal the stars and conceal the nebula, which would be the opposite of what I have here. Uh, it would be the inverted mask, or we use it to cover stars, as the name implies, as a star mask. Okay. Um, why do we make star masks? Adjusting parameters of the stars and the nebula separately. The parameters that may be may benefit from having a mask or being manipulated through a mask are things like color, saturation, brightness, contrast, sharpness, etc. That is, we can change the color of the stars, enhance their saturation, perhaps, uh, and just affect the stars and not affect the nebula. Conversely, we can reveal the nebula and conceal the stars as a star mass normally does, and then adjust the saturation or color or detail in just the nebula. It allows us targeted applications of tools as well. So we can, for instance, reduce noise in the nebula while not processing the stars. Often the sharpening and uh, noise reduction tools to stars badly or cause artifacts. So if we can protect the stars from those processes. They remain looking pretty much like ordinary round stars. We can also transfer content. For instance, if you had a narrow band image and you wanted to put RGB stars into that image, you could write a little equation in pixel math that would transfer stars from an RGB image into the narrow band image. That would be pretty straightforward to do. We can also identify the stars, mark them for other programs that can remove stars. 
and GIMP with its resynthesizer uh, process in GIMP is pretty good at removing stars. I think it's at least as good as StarNet, for instance. And it can, uh, you can use the mask you generate in PixInsight to tell GIMP where the stars are and uh, let it work from there. There are issues with star masks. One of the major, major problems is that uh, images and mass star sizes, uh, the image and the mask have star sizes that differ, causing artifacts to be produced around the edges of the stars as you process the image. And in a similar vein, star halos are not accommodated by an ordinary mask, not usually anyway. And it's hard to make a mask if the image contains galaxies or globular clusters. So you do most of your masking when you're dealing with nebula in your images. And worst of all is masks often miss large stars. And conversely, they miss the large stars and they don't eliminate all the nebula. Some of the nebula uh, leaks through into your star mask. And therefore, if you're saying, gee, I'm going to enforce my mask so that I don't process stars, you're also going to not process pieces of the nebula. And making a mask that includes large stars and, large, and excludes nebula is the focus of this talk. So here's where star mask apparently came from. Basically, it's the output of a high pass filter. A high pass filter is one that uh, passes high frequency information and stars are small. So they are down in this high frequency domain of information. Whereas most nebula, particularly large diffuse hydrogen clouds are, are large features and they are the ones that are not passed by a narrow, by a high pass filter. So in this illustration, we have, um, so I can do this. No. Okay, we have an original image here, for instance, and we might change it to a grayscale image. Here I've used multilinear transform the tools in PixInsight, and I said, give me all the wavelets up to size 10. That's if you're a Fourier analysis kind of people, person, that's all the high frequency ones, and eliminate the residuals, everything above this size 10, run it through a histogram transform to stretch the image you come out with, and you have something approximating the star mass down here. And there are other programs that make star mass by this exact procedure. The instructions they give you is to do these steps. Maybe instead of multi-scale uh, multi linear transform, they say apply a, a high pass filter, uh, which they, they then provide. Okay, our star mask everywhere do all programs in, in image in, sorry, in image processing contain tools to build and use a star mask. Well, PixInsight has a very versatile implementation and that's the best one I know of out there. Photoshop has high pass filtering. I don't know whether there are any special add-ons that you can buy separately that might provide some sort of star masking. Uh, I'm unaware of that, I don't use Photoshop. Uh, Astro Pixel Processor, which seems to be gaining um, popularity in our groups, has no star masking capability nor any masking capability at all, which to me makes it a, a non-starter. Uh, Maxim DL, is the same thing. I see no masking capability available in that. Some people use that in preliminary processing. There was a time when we all used it. It was the most advanced tool. I think it's lost that pedestal position. Star Tools uh, is a semi-automatic uh, masking. Various procedures in Star Tools say, make a mask and it throws up a screen that allows you to make a few adjustments and away you go with a, with a mask. It's a little hard to control in my opinion. Uh, nebulosity, I don't think it has any. 
uh, masking capability. It probably has high pass filtering, so you could probably uh, do something, but you have to be able to put the mask on as a separate layer. So just running a high pass filter on an image doesn't make you able to use the image you produce, the mask you produce. AstroArt has masking described by using high pass filtering like in the last slide. And Images Plus does the same thing. I don't think too many of us use those last two, two uh, algorithms anymore. Those two programs. So let's look at the mask making and the workflow that generally works for me. This is what, at least what I try at the beginning. Uh, nothing is guaranteed in this world. And making a mask, a good star mask certainly isn't. Okay, we'll make a star mask by making multiple submasks, and each submask targets a particular size range. Uh, often, you just need two different size ranges to capture the large stars and the small stars in separate masks, and then combine them later. If you have some very large stars, you're very likely to need three masks and have to work a lot harder to make your, your ultimate mask to remove nebula that gets caught up in that final large star mask. The final star mask is simply a mathematical com combination of the three masks and a very simple equation that we put into pixel math and I'll show that later. Okay, here's the star mask interface for PixInsight and the things in the red are set just once regardless of what's, which of the three masks, two or three masks you're going to make for the small, medium, and large stars. Uh, the thing in the green is the only item that you need to change between uh, the small, medium, and large masks. You change the scale. So if you remember, keep the name scale in your mind. Uh, there's a noise threshold which eliminates, determines about how much noise there is in the mission, in the, uh, image because noise can be mistaken for a star and you don't want that so you try to set that noise threshold to eliminate uh, the noise but capture the smallest stars. There's two scaling factors here. Uh, these, these bloat the star mask stars that you make. Uh, we're going to set those to zero as you'll see and so but this is the default value to change those. There's something called a midtone down here. And the midtone of an image is if you have used a histogram in Pixel Insight, you know it has three sliders. There's one at the far left, which is the shadows, one at the far right, which is the highlights, and one in the middle called the midtones. And it is that one in the middle that you usually adjust to get your histogram the way you want. And that's what we do here too. We adjust those things. Uh, that value. So we're going to change this and this and adjust to this and this, and then we'll change scale to make the mask we want, small, medium, or large. Okay, so where do we get the settings for a star mask? Well, the standard thing for me is to start with the defaults, then uh, wander around aimlessly, changing noise threshold, and mid-tone until I get a mask that I think I might be able to use. Well, there's a better way. And this is really the meat of this discussion. You run the program called Statistics, the procedure called Statistics, and it takes the image and it measures it. And if it's a, a black and white image, you only have one column here, this grayscale column. If it's a RGB image, as it is here, then you get one for the R, one for the G, and one for the B, and you get a bunch of statistics. Well, the median statistic is the one that we want to put into midtone range here. And for noise threshold, we want to put in something called average deviation. So if we type these into here, these two, we change this to zero, these two values to zero, and we set the scale where we want it. This is for fairly small stars at scale five. Would be, and we can see if you apply this star mask to this image, here's the star mask you get. These are all pretty small stars. 
these big stars shown here circled don't appear in this di in this diagram or in this uh, image, but the image does a really good job of bringing out those small stars, giving them reasonable intensity within the image. So do we make a large star mask? All we do is increase that scale value. We set it five and we keep everything else the same. And here we set the scale in this particular image to 10. This is an experimental thing. You've got to go up and down, change it to 10. Uh, and you get this image, which is good. You change it to eight and these star, this big star disappears or becomes very faint. So you have to iterate a bit on this. But in this image, you can see we got these big stars. We got most of these medium sized stars, but the small stars, if they're present here at all, are pretty dim and uh, won't function very well as a mask. If you have something that's intense near a value of one on a scale of zero to one for intensity, it covers that star and prevents any action you take from affecting that star. But if you cover it with a mask that's 0 0.01, the mask is there, but it's 99% ineffective. It, lets, it leaks information about what it is you're trying to do through and distorts the star. Okay. Then what we do is use a simple pixel math equation. We take the small and the maximum value of the small star mask and the large star mask. And if we want to put multipliers in there, say I want to emphasize the small stars, bring them up even brighter. And I'd rather have those uh, at that brightness than any little thing in the uh, large star mask, we can do that. So we could write an equation like this. We could leave out the K1 and K2 here. And then it's just give me the maximum value at every point within the image, whether that came from the large stars or the small stars. And when we do that, this is the mask we get for this particular case. It looks pretty good to me for a star mask. Uh, sometimes there's a haze in the background and we can get rid of some of that haze by adjusting one of the things uh, in uh, says here adjusting the shadow value i don't usually do that there are other ways of getting rid of the haze but you can bring the shadow value up a bit and it'll get rid of the background you could also drop uh, increase the noise value a little bit and that will also get rid of the background because the background will be assessed as being noise okay um uh, Scales, as we showed earlier, is a bit, the number of wavelet layers that we're keeping. Hence, increasing the scale increases the size of objects that we create, keep. So here I moved the scale from 10, which we use to make the large star mask, to 12. And now we've included almost everything in the image. This doesn't look like much of a star mask. If we wanted to operate on just the nebula, uh, put this mask on top, the mask would conceal the nebula, at least to some degree as well. So um, we can adjust uh, the scale down until we get the, the size stars we want and eliminate as much nebula as we can. Um, so here's the keeping the star scale at 12. That's what we had in that last bad image but we changed the noise threshold to some huge number like 0.75. It was originally down around 0.08. Now we're up at 0.75. Well, that not only got rid of the noise, it got rid of the nebula, and it also got rid of a lot of the star, small stars. So somewhere between the original value and this value, we might find a noise threshold that gives us the mask we want. Okay. We can change the mid-tone setting, that one right here in, that I said that we get from the statistics. Uh, we can change that mid-tone st setting. If we increase it, we get rid of the nebula. This again is that bad, a bad mass with the, with the nebula in it. And we get rid of the nebula and we get rid of, but you can see it maybe on your screen just very faintly still here. So that was, wasn't very effective. Uh, 
if we increase the mid-tone value, I'm sorry, if we decrease the mid-tone value, it even makes the nebula more prominent. So these are adjustments that you can balance back and forth between these two, two extremes to try to get the mask you want. Okay, here's the final image from the two masks we had, and it didn't have any weighting factors. All I did was say that the mask is the maximum of the small and large masks that I made earlier in this discussion. And it's shown in green here, overlying the, uh, the image. And it looks pretty effective. Okay, um, another example. This is uh, CG4, and this is a mask made from a luminosity st uh, stack that was not stretched. It was still in its linear state. And I like to make the masks from linear uh, luminosity information. And uh, it seems to do the very best. I think that's, uh, this is the image, I'm sorry. This is not the, the mask, obviously. So there's the sm small mask here I made very small. So these are the very small stars in the mask. Here's a medium star mask. And here's the large star mask. And then combine them all together. This is what the mask looks like. It looks pretty good. And uh, I guess I don't have an image where I put that over the top of the other image, but leave it to your imagination. Okay. So some recommendations. I have on this is to extract your mask from linear stacks, um, preferably from luminosity. If you took luminosity images, if you didn't take luminosity images in PixInsight, it's easy to extract it from an RGB image. <clears throat> or even simpler, just take your three RGB uh, images before they're combined, your, your individual color stacks, which are grayscale, and just add them all together and use that. Uh, use growth parameters of zero. Now, there may be cases where you want to bloat your stars a little bit, then you can use a growth parameter of one. Two almost is always too much. And unfortunately, apparently, they have to be in the integers. Again, it has to do with the, uh, the scale. Uh, you can get the initial estimates of the noise threshold and mid-tone values from image statistics. And the brightest stars tend to elude the masking process, or mask making process, and you can adjust the mid-tones uh, to adjust the largest stars size and intensity. And ultimately, when all else fails, you may need to go in and clone stamp away some of the nebula that remains in your image. What I'd like to do here, uh, finally, okay, I've written a script that does a lot of this work for you, and I thought I'd I'd show you how it works. Uh, if I can guess where, uh, there we go. Here's Pix Insight, and this is the image we're going to try to make a star mask for. And I couldn't pick a worse image to try. Uh, what with the Globular cluster down here. I think it's M4, M4 or 1402. And um, it's hard to mask galaxies and clusters. And up here we have a nebula. Matter of fact, it comes all through here. And a very bright star in the middle of the nebula. This is about as tough an image to make a mask as I can imagine. Um, let's see what happens this out of the way. This is the script that I wrote. And what it does is it allows you to make masks small, medium, and large, and then to combine them. It takes the, it has a noise level slider, and that comes filled in with the statistics from this particular image. If you opened it on a different image, it would be different. So these are the two things we, we were going to adjust. Uh, these these scales are the, the scale we had in the, uh, the mask, masking tool. So three says we're going to use three layers, six layers, and nine layers. You can change those as you want. 
when we combine for the final mass, I say multiply the small stars by 1.2, leave the medium and stars as they are, and multiply the large stars by 1.3. Again, totally adjustable. You can grow the, the stars small in the small, medium, and large mask as you want. Here I have the default as one. Uh, so all we do is once we've invoked this window for a first try is just hit the button run and it starts making the mask. So there's the small mask, small star mask, and it's working on the medium star mask. There's the medium star mask. And now it does the most difficult one, the large star mask. And you notice we have yet to catch that big star that was up here surrounded by nebula. And just about there, star masking can be slow. And there's the large mask and it comes back up. We'll leave this here. Uh, so here's the combined mask for the whole thing. Let's put the mask on it just for the heck of it. Whoops, I missed it. Try again. Okay. When the mask comes on, it reveals the stars. And what we want to do to look at it is uh, conceal the stars and show the, the mask. So I need to invert the mask. And there's the mask that we made. Uh, it did a remarkable job. We've got the large star covered. Many of the stars that are in the halo around it are covered. And we even got some coverage in the outskirts of, of the globular cluster that makes sense. The center of the globular cluster is, is protected, uh, which is probably what we would want anyway, but it's not resolved the individual stars. So I think uh, that's what I pretty much have to say about this topic. I'll make my view graphs available to the group as we usually do. And I'll also include my uh, script for anybody who wants to play with that. Thank you. And I can All stop. right, thank you. Thank you. So do we have any questions for Alex? Yeah, I have a question. Um, can you go back to your second, uh, that, that um, the growth uh, parameter that you specified there, I was curious in the last slide when you said you had 1.2 or something like that and you left the others at one, were you just trying to increase the size okay. of, yeah, just before that. I, okay, hold on. Yeah, I, I, let, me, let me just bring this up. This one will, will work. Uh, whoops. Okay, this, these are the things that grow the size of the star down here in the last row. So the large scale one I grew by a one, uh, which is the lowest next to zero that you can grow it. These values up here are just weighting functions of what you weight each of the three masks as you combine them. Ah, uh, that's what so, I missed. Yeah, it was that second row that confused me. Okay, those are weighting factors. Okay, for the combination. Factors. Got it. Yeah, so you multiply this and multiply this middle by this, middle and the third by this, and then take the largest value at each pixel. Okay. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Good. Anything else? Okay. Stop sharing. Hi, Alex, um, at the very beginning, you talked about um, some of the reasons you'd want to generate a star mask uh, in the first place. For example, yeah. to transfer the RGB to a, a different frame or to a narrow band image. Um, yeah. So to do that, you would, you would create the mask the way you've described it, but then you'd also invert the mask. I mean, can you give me a couple of examples of, of when you might create a sophisticated mask like you've demonstrated, but then invert it? In other words, okay. rather than block well, masking the stars um, to mask the background, for example. Yeah, well, the, uh, the let me do the transfer thing first. Uh, depending on 
how you write, all you're going to do is transfer. I do the transfers and pixel, pixel math. So that what it is, is one uh, image is multiplied by the mask in one state, and the other image is, uh, is multiplied by the mask in the inverted state. So one shows the stars and one shows the background, and then you, you put them together by some equation. Uh, Often just, again, a simple maximum of the two works pretty well for most things. Actually, I've written a whole nother script that does has five equations to select from to try to get the stars across into the other image intact with color and everything else. Uh, so another one well, the second part of your question is when would you use the direct mask and the inverted mask? Well, for instance, if you want to change the saturation of your stars, then you use the, the star mask as it's produced. That is, the background is concealed, the stars are in white. Uh, so uh, then they could be operated on by something like the, the saturation tool in PixInsight. Conversely, if all you do is hit that little invert button for the mask, now you've concealed the stars and revealed the nebula, and now you could adjust anything you wanted in the nebula. You could uh, adjust the color or the uh, saturation or even uh, sharpen it with unsharp mask and not affect the stars. Yeah, I guess that's what I was, I was getting at, that there's a multitude of uses for, for star masks, um, both inverted and regular. <laughs> Yeah, and then uh, if when you get clever with this stuff, you can play games like you can uh, take a a nebula and mask the stars in it, and then you want to treat the nebula different than the background, and you can blend the star mask with the nebula mask, and let the background be revealed and cover both the stars and the nebula. And then you can drop the background down, make it blacker so you can't see noise on it, for instance. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how I would do image processing if, Matt, if, the, if the tool didn't have versatile masking uh, capabilities. And temp, as far as I know, PixInsight is exclusively the tool that has that. So Alex, uh, do, do I get the impression from you that um, you do most of your masking with the star mask tool. Do you do range, do you use a range mask tool or a game mask or any other kinds of masks? I certainly use the game tool, which for those of you who don't know is one that draws outlines around uh, adjustable outlines, user adjustable around target information. Like you could put one around a galaxy or uh, around a particular nebula or anything you wanted. And yeah, I use that one quite a bit. I don't use most of the others. Um, matter of fact, okay. other than star, star mask, I would say, you know, then use star mask on almost every image. I use uh, other masks, any one other mask, maybe in 20% of my images. So 80%, I only use star mask. Interesting. So, I'll have to spend a little more time with star masks. I, I find myself using, I use game mask every once in a while, you know, for particular problems where I can uh, make an ellipse uh, work uh, of some kind or another. But I find myself using range mask a lot. And because uh, I can make, you know, five or six range masks with different sizes uh, to emphasize either the core of the galaxy or the arms or whatever. And uh, I haven't, you know, and I do use a star mask. I use a star mask certainly for local uh, support on deconvolution and other kinds of things. But, uh, but for the most part, I don't, I don't use the star mask unless, like you said, I mean, I do like using a star mask for differentiating between the saturation levels I want in the stars and the saturation level I want to bring down in the background or whatever. But uh, I'll have to maybe play with that a little bit more. The, the reason why I ask is because using a star mask tool, that, that's kind of an expensive, that's a time uh, intensive thing to do. It takes a long time to run a star mask, uh, at least on the images that I'm running, <coughs> excuse me. 
it seemed like if I wanted to play with those parameters, I'd be that that's a good day's worth of work to <laughs> to play with those parameters because it takes a long time to run that star mask. Yeah, making a star mask, uh, especially uh, on a large image, is is a very slow process on most computers, uh, and so yeah, and that's why I, I wrote that that tool to try to cut down the number of iterations I do in order to get the mask I want. And, okay. yeah, you know, I don't know how great. many times I don't know how many times I've settled for a less than than good star mask just because it was past my bedtime and time to give it up. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a fair uh, yeah, fair description because I think that we probably all settle for the star mask that we get. I'm I'm curious to play with your uh, with your script and see how that how that works. That's nice. Well, uh, my scripts are all all work for the things I do. If you come across bugs, uh, please let me know, and I will try to get rid of them. Though I have to say, this entire thing of programming in JavaScript for Pix Insight is the most opaque thing I've ever done in my life. Uh, there's no documentation on how they. they there's a list of. Uh, of attributes that you can do something with, but no, no indication of what it is you do with them or how. So you dig through everybody else's programs and hope they have the same problem you're having and solved it. <laughs> so anyhow, All right. don't look at my <laughs> Anything else for Alex? Uh, Alex, when do you use StarNet? Uh, when do I apply it? Yes. So I, I apply it uh, usually very early. Uh, I've written another script that allows me to use StarNet on uh, linear unstretched images. And if I don't use it on those, I, if I don't use it then, I very often do it quite early, as early as I can in the process. Um, now StarNet produ produces a, a mask but it's uh, not a good mask at all. It has, it, StarNet picks up all pieces of halos, but not all of halos. And so the stars that it captures and the star shapes it captures uh, have very little to do with, with what a star actually looks like. So I avoid using that, but I apply it early. Uh, I was gonna say there's another uh, script available for PixInsight. I can't remember its name right now, but it will go, go to catalogs and pull stars out of the catalogs and draw them according to your specification of what the point spread function is. The problem with it is all the catalogs seem to be, uh, seem to neglect bright stars. So you never end up with any bright stars in your mask. Um, but there are other alternatives. All right. Well, thanks, Alex. That was uh, great. And we'll pass the uh, recording along as well as uh, your slides so that uh, everybody can have a chance to review them. I'll send it all to you hopefully tomorrow. Okay. So, um, uh, what we've been doing in the past few months is to uh, have a couple of guest presenters um, talk about some different uh, imaging terms. And uh, we didn't have any volunteers for this month, so guess what? Uh, Tom Rolfmeyer and myself are going to uh, tackle a couple of the terms. So, uh, Tom, I think I saw you on board. Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> you go it's, first. It's going to be short and sweet because dithering is really fairly simple. So, I'm going to share my screen. And I'm going to pull up a, um, let's see if I can find it now. There we go. What I thought would be, be more beneficial than me just explaining what dithering is, is to actually direct the group to a, a um, 
really nice article that was done by a, man, a gentleman by the name of Jerry Lugiris, I think is the correct pronunciation, in uh, February of 2017. And if you've ever had a bunch of hot pixels in your image or you get these little strange trails through your image, when you dither, what you're doing is actually telling the telescope to shift its position by a certain number of pixels that you, that you specify. In my case, I use somewhere between three and five pixels. Um, a lot of people dither every image. I don't like to do it quite that often. I prefer to dither um, every other image or every third image um, because quite often I'll take ex in excess of 20 images, sometimes as many as 40. And there is a settling time that's required every time you dither. You're, uh, if you're guiding, your scope has to have time to get back in the position again before it starts taking your image. The benefit of dither of dithering is it because it shifts the image just randomly up, down, left, right. <clears throat> when the software you're using combines the images, it then averages those out. So the effect is, is things like hot pixels, a large amount of noise, it smoothed out. And the benefit of that, of course, is Geez, you don't have all these little funny things, little red dots, little blue dots all over your image. They're pretty much eliminated. So it's a really effective and simple way of improving your images. Um, Jeffrey really talks about this in, in detail. And if, if you, um, let's see, he shows, <laughs> Here's a single image with some train player, some plane trails in it. And then um, he, he, he indicates, and if you look throughout the um, throughout the presentation, he has a number of things where he talks about the hot pixels appearing in the same place on your camera all the time. But when you shift the images, the hot pixels get averaged out. So dithering is simply an easy way to reduce the, the noise in your image, to get rid of a lot of hot pixels. It's very easy to set up in most programs. Um, you can turn it on or off. I've been using the ASI Air Pro, and uh, it has a real easy way of doing it. You just go into um, that section where you're taking images. You tell it you want to turn your dithering on. Um, you're going to do an auto sequence, and you're going to dither it how often and how many pixels you want to move. And then it randomly moves the, the telescope and allows for the telescope to resettle again and then takes your images. So that's dithering in a very simple an easy way. Um, again, if you if you check out Jerry Lugurus, and it's spelled L-O-D-R-I-G-U-S-S -S, um, in Sky and Telescope, it, uh, it's a really very nice article and explains it quite well. That's all I've got. All right. Any questions for Tom? If I can, oh, All right, Tom, you lucked out there. Nobody's got a question for you. <laughs> okay, so um, the topic that I'm going to uh, try to cover real briefly um, is the um, whole idea of using uh, fits. Um, what are f the fits format for uh, astronomical images? And uh, fits. Um, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, the um, idea behind FITS is uh, abbreviation for 
It's a flexible image transport system. And this is the um, way that most uh, professional and most amateur uh, astronomical images um, should be recorded. Not all are, but uh, most should be. So and it actually um, was uh, originally proposed by uh, some researchers, one of whom worked here at Kitt Peak back in the early 80s. And it's gone undergone a couple of updates uh, in the uh, subsequent years. Uh, but basically, the FITS format is a, a standard for uh, adding a header to uh, an image. Uh, and it can be various different types of images. Uh, but the FITS header um, is kind of a simple approach that they came up with where the uh, information is actually just written in ASCII um, code. So anybody could read it, including you or a computer. And it's always an integer of 2,880 bytes. So the first section of the FITS header would be 2,880 bytes. And it kind of reverts back to the idea when uh, we used Fortran and there were 80 characters in a, in a punch card. So 36 times 80 gives you 2880. But then you could have uh, an additional um, amount of header set up by the particular program, but it always has to be a multiple of that 2880. Uh, and it, the header actually consists of keywords, uh, some of which are mandatory, most of which are optional, and then a value attached to the keyword. So uh, that the information you need about the image or that the computer needs about the image uh, is all contained uh, in a organized fashion. Typically, the first part of the FITS header will uh, designate the format of uh, the data that's in the image itself, how the image is stored, whether it's uh, unsigned integers or 16-bit signed integers or floating point. Uh, data. So that tells the person looking at the header or the computer software that looks at the header uh, what, how the image is, was, is constructed. So here's an example of an image. And um, I've just shown you over here, this is the first 2,880 bytes of that um, FITS header. And you can see the first column here you probably can't read these, we'll, we'll show them a little, a little larger in just a second, but this first column is the keywords, and the second column uh, is a value that's attached to the keyword. And so you can see there's a lot of information here, uh, all dealing with this particular image. So there are a few mandatory keywords that come right at the beginning of the header, and that basically tells uh, whoever's looking at this uh, what the format, the numerical format is uh, in, the, in the image, and then uh, how many axes the image has. Now, normally we think of an image as having two axes, X and Y, but if it's a color image, uh, the third axis might be uh, the color information. And the, uh, the fit setter is pretty flexible because it can be used to, can be attached to things other than actual images. Um, although I don't have any examples of that. So the highlighted ones here are the mandatory keywords. And then you see some of the other typical keywords. For example, there's some scaling uh, keywords. There's the date of observation, the exposure time uh, in seconds, the uh, temperature of the uh, uh, imaging device, um, the size of the pixels, uh, of, of the uh, imaging device, um, any binning factors, and then if a subframe was used, uh, where the X and Y uh, position are to, to define the borders or the uh, outline of that subframe. Some of the uh, additional keywords that are then listed below that have to do with the observation or the target uh, of the image itself. And here you can see things like, uh, was it a raw image? What type of filter was used in this case? Luminance, 
uh, the image type light frame. Um, there's some information about the, uh, the auto guiding tracking, the uh, focal length of the main telescope, et cetera, as, along, along with um, the uh, object right ascension and declination. That's the center of the image, as well as its altitude and azimuth. And then there's some information uh, about uh, whatever the user puts in that gets added in. So again, um, some of this data is, is information that's added in. So for example, I'm the observer and uh, this was an image of M53. Finally, uh, toward the bottom, um, when you do things like calibrate the image, then certain additional keywords uh, get added into that header to let you know what was done. And this is one of the more uh, useful um, components as far as I'm concerned of the FITS header because many times we'll calibrate an image and then the something goes wrong and the calibration doesn't look right. And I think Doug, you had some examples of this in a previous session, um, but the, um, or someone had some examples of this from in a previous session, but it's very useful sometimes to go back and see just exactly which calibration frames from your library were used. So you can see here, um, in this case, for this particular image, it said that uh, bias, dark, and flats were used, BDF, and it tells us which bias subtraction frame from my library. It tells me the size, the bidding, the temp, et cetera. Same thing for the dark subtraction and flat field, as well as the bias dark uh, that were applied to the flat itself. So uh, by looking at this information that's contained in the FITS header, you can many times say, oh, it used a dark subtraction uh, that really was at uh, the wrong temperature, um, or that I hadn't, uh, uh, it's not a dark that I would have selected. You can go back, change the um, uh, appropriate dark frame that you want to use and recalibrate. So uh, this information is uh, very useful uh, when things go wrong during calibration or stacking. One last uh, thing that uh, is useful uh, that gets included in the FITS header, and this is just a portion uh, of what could be added. But for example, if I plate solved the uh, image in question, the image of M53, um, the, uh, the plate solving uh, software adds ad additional keywords and values to the FITS header. And this is the, uh, what's called the world coordinate system. So that the, any software that uh, needs to use the plate solve information can go back and read this uh, data in order to um, uh, do whatever it has to do. For example, if you do astrometric stacking, um, the, each individual frame that you're stacking has to be plate solved. This information gets stored and then it's used when the astrometric uh, stacking is performed. So again, uh, that's uh, uh, done uh, by uh, application of the FITS header. So I'm gonna stop at that point. Uh, uh, you can see there's a lot of information there. And I recommend if you haven't looked at the FITS headers of your image before, take a minute and scroll through there and, and familiar yourself with what's inside. Any questions? Yeah, uh, Greg, I was wondering, uh, is, is FITS the format that you and um, Alex use on most of the time, or uh, what what format do you usually uh, save your images in? I always save them in FITS. I mean, the, the raw image coming out of the camera uh, gets saved in FITS, Six, and I believe it's 16-bit floating point. Yeah, I think if, if you're talking about what comes out of a camera, virtually always 
if it's an astro camera, it saves in, in fits. If you're talking about process, an image that has undergone processing, then you can save it in a wide variety of things. There's a format that's similar to FITS that's, it's not proprietary, it's PixInsight uses, which is uh, XIF, XIF or something like what we call the abbreviation. I often use that uh, well in processing. One thing I would like to mention though, is a lot of this data, uh, in the fits header disappears when you manipulate the image. If you do something like crop it, uh, then this data is no longer relevant and it gets deleted from the image. So if you are counting on this data for some particular purpose, you may want to make a copy before of the image before cropping it or rotating it or doing some other manipulations with it because it disappears. Yeah, well, one other thing to mention is um, some of the software that you use for image acquisition, for whatever reason, they allow you to save it in some other format other than FITS. And don't do that. <laughs> Resist the urge to use some compressed format just to save a little bit of disk space because most of the time uh, you need this, this basic information. Well, that was the reason I asked because uh, the software I use does allow me to save it in several different other formats. And uh, I've noticed on the forums, there's always a lot of uh, give and take on which format to save it in. Uh, I think the majority of people prefer fits, but uh, uh, I was just get, wanted to get your opinion. Yeah, I, I, you, there's nothing wrong with saving in one of the um, other formats. And as I said, you know, at Maxim DL and some of the other programs give you several different options for, you know, compressing the data. But um, to, to be consistent with what the professionals do, um, I would recommend that you stick with FITS. It, it doesn't add very much to the, to the size of the images the way we're talking about them these days when you think about 2,800 bytes. All right, well, um, I just want to mention a couple of things before we call it uh, for the evening. Um, our next uh, meeting will be on the 21st of June by Zoom. Um, that's, I believe, the um, summer solstice, We're pretty close. So you can put that on your calendar. Uh, Tom and I, um, briefly discussed the uh, idea that a lot of you guys are not in Tucson and that when we go back to in-person meetings, uh, we're going to have to kick you off. No, we're not. Um, what we're going to do is we're probably going to come up with, if, if and when we go back to uh, in-person meetings, we're going to try to make sure that we continue to also record the meetings via Zoom so that uh, those of you who uh, aren't able to attend in person uh, can still participate. And of course, that'll give us the ability to record as well. So people who don't even show up for the meeting uh, can go back and look at it later on. So um, that's, we, hit, we don't know right now when they're going to allow us to go back to having in person meetings. Um, but we've had good luck with uh, Zoom, I think, so far. So we'll probably have some sort of a hybrid approach. Uh, when we get to that point. Also, I want to mention that the uh, TAA uh, AAA Bulletin uh, got renamed to Desert Skies, and um, David Rossiter is the editor of that, and I spoke with him about including images. Uh, the uh, bulletin's been kind of shard on the stuff to look at other than, you know, the things that are usually in there, and he agreed, and if you looked at the bulletin last month, you noticed that a couple of member images were in there. Uh, and so I plan to uh, submit a couple of images uh, every month to him so that he has something to spice up the bulletin. I wanted to mention that to uh, everyone in the AISIG group, uh, simply because um, if you don't want your images to be shared, uh, please let me know. You can email me privately 
Um, uh, otherwise, if you share your images on the TAA forum, um, then I'm going to consider them uh, submitted for possible inclusion in the bulletin. Not everybody that's in TAA is on the forum, so it's nice for them to be able to see uh, that we're actually producing some really, really good images. And uh, one of the ways of doing that is to uh, have them in the bulletin. So when you uh, submit an image, be sure you tell us, you know, any specifics about the image, um, how you acquired the image, uh, anything special about it, and we'll try to include that. Uh, any questions on that? Maybe only that the, the rights for those images remain with their owners yeah. and that we're giving you guys limited rights for sharing in the bulletin, but not to include other distribution mechanisms, yeah? Okay, I can mention that to David and see, make sure that's included. Yeah, shouldn't have a carte blanche there. Uh, yeah. you know, for the bulletin, sure. For other purposes, then at least the owner should be made aware and should have to agree to that. Agree, this is, this is just for inclusion in the bulletin. Great. Okay, good, good point. All right. Well, if, um, if so uh, actually, I, I, yeah, I'd, I'd like to request just a moment, okay. if I can, on a similar vein. Um, I've been talking to uh, Jim Knoll and uh, John Kalis. There's a um, there's a monitor out at CAC that is uh, woefully underused, and I think uh, in the near future they're going to have a um, they're going to they're negotiating right now to get the RMO reopened again. And uh, I was talking to those guys about maybe having uh, a CAC astrophotography um, slideshow there so that when the RMO is open and people can go in there, that folks who have taken uh, astro images at CAC will have, you know, have an opportunity to have their stuff uh, showcased on that, on that monitor. I think they liked that idea. Uh, there may be a couple different uses that could happen uh, uh, for those images. And so I just like to announce, I, I, I talked to them and said that I would precede that attempt to uh, pull that together. So folks who have taken images at CAC, um, if you're, you know, if you're interested in having any of your images show up on that slideshow, uh, send me an email, will you? And I'm going to put together a disc uh, that can be plugged into the back of that TV. And all TVs now have a nice slideshow there that they can roll. I did a preview for Jim on that and it worked out pretty well. So um, if that's of interest to anybody, then uh, let, let me know. I think we can get a nice slideshow there for both the community and kids that go out there and uh, even for us, right? When we're out there and the RMO is open again, uh, be nice when we go in there for a cup of hot chocolate or something to be able to see uh, our work on that, on that big monitor. So FYI. Okay. Anything else? Yeah, one question. There was some discussion, um, I don't know, three or four months ago about having um, permanent uh, roll-off observatories uh, at CAC. Has anything progressed on that? I haven't heard anything else. John? Yeah, the, um, Bob Reynolds is coordinating the um, a new project for member observatories at the uh, CAC site. Um, I've adjusted the master site plan to include 17. Originally, we had 15 proposed to the county when we first uh, um, undertook our special use permit. Uh, but we've increased it to 17, and we've also added uh, a couple of areas for large uh, Dobsonian telescopes that we're considering putting at one end of the uh, of this project. So we um, uh, Bob Reynolds has contacted or solicited interest in this project, and those people who uh, showed interest and, and, and responded to his solicitation. He's contacted them and we have uh, somewhere in the vicinity of 10 
10 people who are uh, genuinely interested in considering that. Now, we're, we're faced with several issues um, going forward, uh, not the least of which is finding a contractor who can handle uh, some of the work. We, we did have a, um, a, a virtual meeting with the uh, Cochise County Permit Department uh, requesting relaxation of a requirement that they put on us way back when we first got our special use permit, where everything on the CAC site has to be built by a commercially licensed contractor. Well, the main interest in this particular member observatory area is having backyard observatories from uh, Ohio come in and actually build the wooden portion of these observatories. And um, most, if not all, of the interested parties that Bob Reynolds has talked to have agreed that they are interested in a backyard observatories product. And we've selected three, maybe four styles and sizes of backyard observatories that we may offer um, people to, uh, to put in. But backyard observatories only builds from the slab up. They do not do any prep work. They do not do any slab, concrete slab work. They don't do piers. Well, they do, they, 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 they sell uh, metal piers that you can bolt up, but they don't do the, uh, the slab. Uh, and so we have to find a contractor who will do all the prep work, uh, clearing the site, grading the site, um, trenching for the utilities. We have electric and internet, uh, fiber optic capabilities that need to be put in. Um, then we have slabs, uh, obviously quite a number of slabs that have to be poured depending on the size of uh, observatory that the person may want. And then at that point, we uh, arrange to have backyard observatories come into town and start throwing these things up. And they, they build an observatory in about two days, they can, they can, from the slab, they can put up an observatory, maybe three days, but uh, they're getting pretty good at it. And uh, so, you know, we've, we have worked and contacted backyard observatories. They're interested in the project. They um, would be willing to come out for an extended period of time. Um, weeks at a time, four to six weeks, perhaps. And uh, in that period, you know, put up as many units as they can. The, so, so getting uh, Cochise County to allow a actually non Arizona licensed contractor to come in and put this up on our commercial site. Uh, we weren't sure that our pitch was going to be very well received, but we were very surprised that the new generation of uh, permit department employees, and it's literally completely different than, matter of fact, not literally, it is. There, there's nobody left there that I am aware of that I dealt with 10 years ago. And, and that's good because a lot of the old, uh, the old guard uh, who were really pushed by the special use permit to put unreasonable restrictions on us for this project, 
those people are all gone. And these new people, they don't even, they don't remember any of that. <laughs> Fortunately, <laughs> and you, apparently- and you didn't they didn't remind them, right? <laughs> no, no, we didn't remind them at all. Uh, but anyway, they, they have um, given us the permission to use backyard observatories. And, and the next important thing is we do not have to officially put backyard observatories under a general contractor uh, as a sub. And that's one way to get around the right. uh, non-commercially licensed uh, people is you get regular uh, contractor licensed people come in under a commercially licensed general contractor as a sub and the county buys that well we don't have to do that and and what's very important about that is whenever a general contractor takes on a sub like electric plumbing concrete excavating every one of those subs the general contractor marks up their work of course. And that's how they make their money. Right. We, we are not going to do that with backyard observatories. We are looking for a general contractor that only needs a regular Arizona license. It does not have to be commercially licensed, which is a big benefit. Sure. And well, it, we will ahead. not allow them, it will go in to negotiations with these contractors that they they will be considered like a general contractor, but they are not going to be permitted to mark up uh, backyard observatories. In fact, we will pay backyard observatories separately for their work uh, to ensure that it doesn't get marked up on us. And that saves literally thousands of dollars per observatory. Uh, because the, the the general contractors will mark up anywhere from fifteen to twenty percent. So when you do when you do a ten thousand dollar backyard observatory uh, and you mark it up twenty percent, you've saved yourself a considerable amount of money, and that's what we're interested in. And apparently, we have the blessing of Cochise County to do that. Now, the problem is finding a contractor who has time in their uh, queue, in their business, which we're finding out is very difficult right now. Um, the several contractors that I have talked to absolutely are turning down business because they, they don't have skilled labor. They don't have sufficient skilled labor which we're hearing is a big problem in the construction industry right now. Well, it's, it's a big problem in Cochise County. Uh, materials have gone through the roof, costs for materials. So we're, we're on this type of an arrangement uh, and uh, you know, see, see what we can do. The other thing that we're, we're doing is this member observatory project has to be self-paying. Um, if we want to put up 17, 15 or 17 observatories, we need 15 or 17 TAAA members, checks in hand, ready to, ready to go. There, there are no, you, it, you, can't, you can't put in half the infrastructure, you can't you know, put in half the roads uh, or not finish the roads, assuming you're gonna, you're gonna enlarge it later. The, there are constraints by the, the uh, Cochise County Permit Department that will not, not, not allow us to piecemeal this type of uh, an operation. And of course, club funding, uh, absolutely will not allow, the club is not going to fund observatories on speculation, hoping that they sell them later. So one of the ways that we're trying to get around this is Jim Knoll uh, has submitted an article to Astronomy Magazine uh, about the CAC site 
with the pitch at the end about this member observatory and we're actually fishing um, the world for people who may be interested in jumping on this opportunity. Uh, we think there is a lot of opportunity out there. Um, obviously, finding 17 people within the club to, to belly up for the amount of money that we may be looking at to put one of these in uh, is a stretch. And we knew that going in. But we think that if we advertise and market this outside the club, that we have an opportunity to reach full occupancy and full uh, commitment so that we can go ahead and just hit this thing and, and not stop until we get them all up. Um, so th that's, that's a long-winded explanation of what, what's going on, but uh, we're, we're looking for a, a, a contractors right now. And uh, we're also anxious to see what happens with this astronomy magazine article that's supposed to go in, I believe, the October uh, edition of astronomy. And um, so we're, we're excited about that and hoping that it generates interest so that we can uh, go ahead and, and do this thing fully and not have to just because if, if, you know, ultimately, wherever we end up, how many people we have committed to this thing is how many we're going to build. So if, if we have a NASA site plan that calls to 17 and we only get eight people at the end, that's how many will go in, eight. And uh, whether we can enlarge it later on, it's going to be pretty difficult, uh, but, but we'll have to see. So well, it'd be, it'd be nice to do the thing. I haven't heard any of this. Now, I, I've been out of town a lot. So I think it was mentioned in like the February uh, meeting or something. And so you've given me a lot of information I didn't have then. So apparently I didn't do a good enough job of getting my name floated to the right people. Or I, I think I would have been up to speed on this. That, um, that, I, you know, I, 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 I don't know if Bob Reynolds has... He, he, I'm sure he hasn't detailed that explanation that I've just given uh, okay. to, to everyone. So um, make sure that Bob Reynolds has your name. I don't, I don't know. I don't have a list of the people. He's coordinating that and taking care of that. I'm working the construction end of it. Uh, he's well, coordinating I, the project. To that, to that point, I had a conversation earlier today because I'm contemplating putting a pier on my property. Up. I live up in Catalina, almost in Pinell County. Right. And um, I had a conversation with a, with a man who has a contracting business um, nearby, almost a neighbor of mine. And uh, I thought it was going to be a very short conversation. And he's a very engaging fellow. And when he helped, found out what I was doing and the conversation went an hour. Um, so I was kind of surprised that a contractor had that much time to talk to me. Um, the point I'm getting to here is uh, he's going to meet with me sometime this next week. Um, and as he, he does the kind of thing that you just described, doing your trenching the infrastructure and, and pouring pads and stuff. And in fact, he's doing the rough plumbing on a house that's about uh, a block and a half from where I live right now. Um, so that's kind of his bag, so to speak. So I may have a line on somebody. I don't, it's much too early, of course, to say, but uh, when he comes out and looks at my property, uh, I will ask him and maybe I should in the interim talk to, uh, is it Bob Reynolds, was that the name? Yes. Yeah, I, I'm really new to the club. I've only, you know, been with it for a couple of years and been gone most of the time, or at least half of the time. So I don't know the names and the people very well. Um, that I guess uh, I can go on the 
club website and find out how to get a hold of them. Yes, um, um, there, there should be, they were supposed to put on the website, on the, the CAC webpage, a link to this new project, the member observatories and the okay. large DOB pads. Um, it may be there. I just haven't gone looking for yeah, it. So. No, uh, and, and quite frankly, I, I'm, I don't know that I've actually gone there to confirm that, but that was what was supposed to be done. So that's certainly a good place to start. And okay. uh, we can, uh, you know, we certainly we can get you in touch with Bob to make sure that uh, you are, aware, you know, uh, if you're genuinely interested and, and want to, be in well I, i'm not going to sign up until i you know yeah. the particulars but no, no, no. i'm very i'm very interested yeah well that's great that's great so does this include having somebody on site no it does not when you start doing this remote stuff every now and then something needs to needs to be a have a kick in the pants you know right we the master site plan for the CAC um, complex has a provision in it and an, a, an agreement uh, acceptance by the county to have a caretaker residence positioned actually adjacent uh, to the uh, member pad and the RV area. And uh, that is a totally separate project that would require uh, pursuit and funding. And of course, putting in houses, that's, that's pretty expensive. And uh, at is. this time, we do not have anyone heading up that particular uh, uh, project. And uh, certainly I would think at some point that has to, we're planning to, to build out this member observatory area and immediately push for consideration of a caretaker residence as the next the next project to uh to yeah i i guess there's you know possibility of just putting like an a small rv trailer there and not have it be a permanent residence but you know maybe um, some, maybe we, we have we have a lot of restrictions to, about uh about using um, trailers and and uh, mobile homes and stuff like that, so it, it, okay. it's not as it sounds. But you know, there well, are I, ways. I, 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 I'm just thinking in terms of putting this in the national, international magazines and expecting to get customers or takers from around the world that may have more than two hours to drive to give their instrument a kick. Um, right. They, they're, they're not going to be so crazy about this that they've got to buy an airplane ticket from somewhere. Right. We, you know, we do have members who have joined the club from Cochise County. Uh, in fact, our maintenance supervisor lives in uh, um, uh, Dragoon, and um, he comes to the site regularly. So uh, I'm sure, as an interim, we could um, we could work with uh, this fellow as uh, as a resource to at least on emergency situations to go in and um, and work on a. Uh, an issue. Yeah, well, the other thing too is most of us in the club, I mean, as long as we can get the, the, the roof closed right. and have to deal with weather issues, we can always just go service our own equipment. But if the roof doesn't close and you've got storms coming, that, that could be a real problem. Right. Yep. Uh, there's no doubt about it. But we are going in with the disclaimer. Mm -hmm. That at least initially there 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 is there will be no on-site um, resource to do this. 
and we'll so have to work. Backyard with... guys are is one of the options a, a, a dome rather than a roll off roof. Um, to be honest with you, that hasn't been fully determined yet because we haven't committed to what types of um, structures we we want to put in. The only trouble is we don't want seventeen different observatories. Um, yeah, it's it's unmanageable. You, we have to have some consistency, and yeah. um, we you know we like the and a lot of people like and have heard of the backyard observatory product, and they're interested in it. So I I really don't know whether or not any other um, type and style of observatory will be. Uh, allowed i see okay well i'll need to reach out to bob reynolds and see if i can figure out how to get a hold of him i can do that yeah i tell you what um why don't you take down my email address i'll give it to you right now yeah, let me get my glasses hold on just a moment please Okay, uh, I'm ready. Okay, it's J as in John, okay. C as in Charles, Kalis, K A L A S as in Sam, at Cox, C O X dot net. Okay. So it's J C K A L A S at cox.net got it so if you have any problems locating uh reynolds bob reynolds uh contact information on the website give me a uh send okay. me an email and i i'll send you his link and uh and his address and we'll get you hooked up okay good Thank you. All right, gentlemen, with that, we're going to close this up. We're a little over time, and uh, we appreciate your coming in and spending time with us. And we'll see you again in the 21st of uh, June. Have a All great right. Good night. Thank you.